Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Support is Sexy, our live taping. I am so excited to have our guest here with us, Sybil Amuti. I'm going to tell you about Sybil, who is the founder and creator of the amazing Great Girlfriends podcast. I live for the Great Girlfriends podcast community, all the things you're going to hear about it today. But I want to tell you about the Great Girlfriends and about Sybil, and then we'll jump right in. But if you already know Sybil, you go ahead and drop your questions because I know you have some. Put them in the comments. We make sure we'll make sure we ask them along the way. But let me tell you a bit about Sybil, then we'll welcome her in. So the Great Girlfriends is a personal and professional development community for women providing content, community, and products to support women who want to live a supercharged life. They are over 75,000 women strong across all platforms and serve more than 20,000 downloaders each month from 178 U.S. markets and 100 countries. This is with the Great Girlfriends podcast and community. Since founding in 2015, the Great Girlfriends has been featured in Apple's top 100 podcasts in self-help and business and featured across national media and go-to podcasts for women. Their annual events include a conference, wellness retreats, the online community challenge, and growth groups. The private community, The Bond, is a growth circle for women who desire a greater level of accountability and connection with like-minded women. Their 2021, uh, how do we say that now, 2021? Or t- their 2021 product series includes self-love affirmation cards, candles, mugs, journals, and affirmation kits to help you show up for yourself on a daily basis. Lastly, their larger vision is to acquire existing podcasts. Okay, Sam, I want to know more about this while creating new media content to help shape a more empowering narrative for women around the world. And again, I am so excited to welcome my friend, my great girlfriend, Sybil Amuti. Sybil, thank you for being here. (laughs) Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Elaine. Thank you for hosting this platform, for all that you do. I mean, we've been in parallel universe forever, and it's just a pleasure to get to know your spirit and really, I don't know, just kind of experience you. I feel like it's a full experience. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Hopefully a whole good experience. Excellent. Thank you. (laughs) Great experience. Well, everyone, again, if you have questions for Sybil as we go along, we're going to talk a lot about the Great Girlfriends community, of course, but also about branding overall how to build a brand around your community and all those things. I have plenty of questions. You know, I can questions all, ask questions all day, but I want to hear from you all as well. Whether you're watching this live or you watch the replay later, drop it in the comments. Sybil and I will see it. I will certainly check. We'll make sure we get some answers for you. But Sybil, to far, start out, what inspired you to start The Great Girlfriends and why? what was your why? Okay, so the why was, was very simple at the time. I guess it is the same why. At the time, um, it was 2014 when the podcast first, you know, sort of hit my spirit. And I was an avid podcast listener. I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, I had my favorites. I had my white male voices that were like my 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 uncles and in my head that were teaching me business tricks and hacks and all the things. And um, I also mentored a lot of uh, say young in the New York area. I was a mom, wife. A wife, mom of two toddlers and a traveling professional. So with all of that on my plate, I wasn't able to devote the right amount of time to mentorship that I wanted to. I, my office hours had pretty much run out. And to the point, I had so much I wanted to share, but I didn't know how I could get it to my mentees without having to compromise physical office time and space. I was having a similar conversation with my great girlfriend, Brandis Daniel, and we were just talking about what we both love because we would always talk about podcasts and stuff that we learned on podcasts. And we also talked about how do we reach our mentees and make sure that we're giving them all this stuff that we've learned along the way so they don't have to make the same mistakes. All while really celebrating uh, sort of a center point of what Brandis and I have found is that relationship building friendship is what makes your circle strong. When you are able to relate and connect with people, first connect with yourself and then connect with people. So our idea was, well, let's have, the, you know, these guys did it. <laughs> and how hard how hard can it be? So right. Let's, if they can do it, you know, we can do it. <laughs> so, so, that's what we so, so that's what we did. We uh, took out some time to get some content. What are the things that we talk about? What are the things that, questions that we've asked other women and what are the questions that we get in high frequency? Um, we also met a few girls, quite interesting. We were at Hillstone having a meeting and we met a, those girls. They look like the girls we'd be talking to. Let's 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 go sit with 
them. So we go sit with these three young ladies and we're like, hey, you know, we're starting this podcast and what are you talking about? What do y'all want to hear from women our age? You know, at the time we're we're like third early 30s, and that's like you know, the aunties people. at that point. <laughs> we were aunties. So what do you want to hear? Um, then we invited them to my office to have a, a, a full meeting, and we did um we asked a lot of questions of them, but we also had questions that we had gathered from our community, women that we already knew supported and served, and we just decided to get on the mic and start it and share it. And that it would be something that would just help support women on their journey. And that's, that's literally, you know, the why behind it was, well, as long as people listen, we'll keep recording. That's what we said. <laughs> right. And when you started, did you have any idea? Because people ask me this question and I, I didn't have any idea. But when you started, you did you have any idea or vision at that time that it would grow to be the community that it is today with the, all the extensions and the brand? I mean, you're a brand person, so you might have already had this vision, but just the connection, the amount of downloads and everyone, again, the podcast is called The Great Girlfriend. So make sure you check it out if you don't know already. But what was your vision when you started or was it really so focused on the why at the time it was just like we'll see where this goes well you know it's kind of kind of interesting because you know brandis and i would have this conversation very early in brandis said yes let's make a podcast in my head in my head in my mind let's make a podcast meant let's build a brand so right. <laughs> you're like this is just the start clearly like, this, is me, this is and brandis is like is that a podcast i'm like it's a brand podcast isn't that the same like aren't you building a brand as you you're not gonna just have a podcast. Like in my mind, it was this. And Brandis Brand was like, we're doing a podcast. I'm like, it's a brand. So I did always have in my mind, like what the story could be. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever I have these an ideas for anything, I sit with it, I sit down and I jot it out and I imagine how far, what the tentacles can be and how far it can go. It's just where my brain goes and I don't stop it because I really do like to enjoy the possibility of it. So I did see many things. I didn't see the pace. Mm -hmm. I didn't see how quickly or how slowly some things would take. Um, but I did see some things and I did imagine some things. Um, and I didn't imagine the who's, you, can, you know, I never, I could never imagine we'd sit here, um, who would play the roles, you know, I couldn't mm -hmm. see all of that, but for sure I was like, you know, this can really be a story that every woman can grab onto. Yeah. It sounds like something that I often talk about this, um, pushing ourselves to really let go of the how, and it's not something I came up with. That's something I learned attending this workshop, uh, Momentum, that I talk about in 20, that I attended in 2015, I talk about often. This idea of letting go of the how, you you know, like you said, you had the vision, you could feel that it wasn't happening, you don't know who the people are, or how it's gonna move, or how it's gonna work, but you just kind of going with your intuition and your feeling. But do you find that it's often difficult for a lot of us as women, especially, but maybe a few good men too, I always say, but difficult for us to trust that intuition or that vision when nothing is sort of tangible or you haven't officially started the brand. Yeah, um, yeah I have people, uh, women that I work with as coaching clients and it's it's difficult and I understand to say, do this right now, start this right now before the people build, get here, right? People think, oh, I'll build it when folks get here. It's like, no, build it so that when they show up, they can see how you operate on social media. They can see all the other things that you have. Why is it hard yeah. for us to do that? Well, I think it comes from the idea that people affirm who we are and the worth of the products that we create, right? So a lot of people will wait on people to applaud them for the validation. That means it's good enough. But when you're building a brand, you have to know that your vision is good enough. Like you have to be fully satisfied with the with the idea that you may be the only customer for a long time or for a day or an hour. You never know. But you have to have that internal um, esteem. It, you have to know that what you're building is worth something because what you're doing is communicating that worth outwardly. Versus if, you if you're waiting on other people to tell you how much it's worth, then you'll find yourself manipulating the value here and there just so that you can have validation, which will make your brand messaging unstable and unsteady. It'll make your, 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 uh, your income unsteady. It'll mm -hmm. make everything that deliverables because you're always waiting on people to show you and tell you that you're worth showing up for. You got to know that on the inside that what you have is worth, you know, it's worth investing in. Yeah. And, and Tiffany, I, Tiffany, Tiffany Alice okay. talks a lot about that. Tiffany, you know, the budget nista. The budget nista, yes. For years, she was talked about how she'd get no likes. She'd get four likes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, likes for her measure, she'd have been done. 
you know, mm -hmm. but her measure was, I have something that every woman needs to know. And she's going to share that message of budgeting and, you know, mastery over money long and, and wide enough to now she's got a book that's out and, and you know, and I know she's going to hit the bestseller list, you know? So but wasn't she just on the cover of Forbes or the cover of, she was on the cover uh, of something recently. Was it money fortune. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. But imagine. Yes. I know. Celebrate Tiffany. I know I didn't talk to her. I got to interview her. But um, <laughs> celebrate her. But just so that's such a great example. And I think it's powerful what you said. I want everyone to catch. And it certainly hit for me this idea of, um, you know, we're used to or maybe wanting the applause. But even with that, the applause are after you've done the work. Right. So sometimes we're there's sort of this strange place that we're in where we want the applause before the work is done. And it's sort of like you have to you can't have it both ways. You have to create the work, not that you should pursue the applause, but it has to be either way out in the world for you to build. Or as Tiffany was doing her work and all the things she was doing, she had to build it and then people were able to see it. She couldn't start once people were interested in the work that she was already doing. Sybil, are you there? You look frozen. Uh oh. Okay. Are you there? Okay. I was like, are you there? You froze. I'm back. I talked I talked to you until you froze. How's your internet connection? Are you are you in a spot with good? I was checking I'm, mine here. Everyone, yeah, this is real life. This is technology. This is just how it That's works. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was over here when you first were talking. I just was like, let me close all these windows, you know, all these tabs you have open and up everything. Okay, good. So you're okay now. You're yeah, back. Yeah. I'm back. So we was you're you back. Yourself? Yeah, we're no, I was just saying what you said about the uh, waiting for the affirmation that um, even with that, we have to have something out in the world. You can't sit and hold your idea to yourself, not have it out in the world. Like, I'm going to wait till someone approves it. Well, not uh, enough people have seen it. Right. And I know it's a difficult place yeah. to be in, but it's just a I, I don't know. I believe a change in thinking. It is. And it's unfair. It's unfair to you. It's unfair to your vision. It's unfair to mm -hmm. your, your ambition. All It's unfair to hold these things so near and dear in private and expect everyone to kind of carve through to see this thing that's brewing and hope that people will wait up versus going ahead to say, I believe this is worth you knowing, you sharing, you believing in and putting it out, putting it on display. It's kind of, you know, when a, when a mom has kids, you know, you picture everywhere, you hardly put that kid in a blanket. They want to, <laughs> they want to show you. Now true that this after the baby's born, right? Or even with the pregnancy belly, people are so excited to say, hey, you know, so it's the same right. thing. We have to kind of allow those gifts to be stirred up and to be stimulated and be excited about them and share and promote them in a way that allows other people to opt into that energy. Talk to us a little bit about what you just said, this idea of not being fair to your vision. How, why is it important to um, honor our own vision, even if it adjusts and morphs over time, which most visions do, yeah. but why is it important, especially when we're starting out and we have this idea to be either true to or honor or respect mm -hmm. or love, support our own vision before the approval? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's that's such a great question. So our, actually our theme for 2021 for Great Girlfriends is show up for yourself. And mm -hmm. and it's essential. And, and that's yourself. That includes your vision. That includes your gifting, your calling, your assignments, et cetera. And I say this because we spend the majority of our life, many of us will spend, let me rephrase that, many of us will spend the majority of our life supporting other people's vision and other people's expectations of who we are versus really being willing to stand up and show up and represent all of the beautiful gifts that are sitting on the inside. And there's nothing worse than being on the sideline in your own show, being in the audience and there's an empty stage. We each have a stage, everyone has a platform. And I think we owe it to the world. I think we owe it to the human ecosystem to play our parts because I think I, I really do believe as part of humanity and why we were built and designed to think and live in the world in similar ways, but adopt different ways of operating because what I do supports what you do, vice versa. So if we can each bring our gifts to the table and each be reflective of our assignments, our callings, you imagine how beautiful an experience we can have as humans and the kind of legacy that we'll have for our children and next generation and how many paths we pay because of that. So it's Absolutely. a responsibility. You know, I, I feel like it's, we go back to Mickey Taylor, you know, we're having a conversation, but Mickey talked about, um, I asked her about her ability to translate um, inner beauty from the pages of a magazine, right? This is before we had video access. Mickey just had this glow and this smile that communicated to me in Tennessee as a teenager, you're beautiful, you're worth it. 
you can do anything, you're magnificent, all of this. And she said she felt it was her responsibility on her watch to ensure that every brown, black brown girl felt seen and felt loved and felt beautiful. And it's just that, having that responsibility that comes from when you know what's on the inside and you can honor it and you can show respect for what you see. What you see is worth exposing to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I will tell you just as someone we talked about earlier, as someone who had the pleasure of working with Mickey Taylor mm -hmm. and Susan Taylor and Monique Greenwood and Robin Stone, Claire McIntosh, Audrey Edwards, Rosemary Robotham, mm -hmm. all of these incredible women that I didn't even know existed. I mean, I didn't know they were real people. You know, when I was even growing up in New York, you just see these women in Essence Magazine. It's for mm -hmm. everyone who doesn't know I'm talking about. I was there back in the 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. But Essence Magazine, these writers, these amazing voices, these brilliant mm -hmm. Black women. And I just never, I just couldn't imagine being in their presence. And to have that opportunity and to see just what you said about Mickey is how she mm -hmm. showed up in the office every day on every photo shoot and how all of those women showed up with such a commitment to bring it back mm -hmm. around, commitment to the vision. We yeah. are here to support and edify and bring as much yeah. um, love and beauty and joy to Black women through Essence Magazine and then all the other extensions and events um, that yeah. it created. So I feel like for me, that was such a um, transformational time because I was a woman in my 20s at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't know. I didn't know you could be a writer. Like real people could be a writer. Yeah. Not that they're not real people, but you know, I'm just like regular people could be a writer. I thought you had to, I don't know. I thought it was some special sauce you had to eat or something in order to be able to do it. But just being able to come first into the business in a space with that understanding the importance of an alliance to a vision mm -hmm. uh, was a real blessing for me. So I'm glad that you had that conversation mm -hmm. with Mickey, who has a book out everyone on audible what's the yes. name of the book again? Force, of beauty. Force, force of beauty, of beauty. Yes. yes force of beauty excellent even to the point of essence when you think about it elaine we're still eating off of that vision look That's at this right. you know we're still able to we've inherited the values of that vision we're still able to eat off of it we're still nurtured by the content we're still empowered there's still an mm -hmm. embrace there as a result mm -hmm. of planting that vision and believing in it. And you were able to opt into it and learn so much about who you are and in your becoming process, now do the same for other people, you know? Yes, you're so right. This is why you're yeah. so brilliant. I never thought about it that way. Just um, yeah. it's funny because even throughout my career, once leaving Essence and going to whether it was Vibe or Black Enterprise or uh, Martha Stewart or some other publications that weren't as focused on, you know, or, mm -hmm. uh, focus solely, I should say, on yeah. black women, yeah. I there was that was always missing for me. And not that I only wanted to talk to black women, but because and things have changed now, but at that time, other publications or brands didn't worry about inclusivity, didn't worry about diversity, didn't yes. care about your ID until they determined it was quote unquote mainstream. And we're like, but we've been telling you about Gabrielle Union since 92. They're like, oh, there's this new girl, Gabrielle, you know, whoever it was. You're yeah. just like, what? We It used to happen all the time. And I always mm -hmm. craved that connection again, or being in a place where at least there was such a, um, a dedication to whatever the vision was, even if it was yeah. something else. But I didn't experience that in the same way. I won't say it all, but in the mm -hmm. same way as I did at Essence. And I'm realizing just based on what you say now, like, wow, maybe this is why I craved so much to start my own media platform and have supported mm -hmm. sexy podcasts and talk to women like you. And yeah. so it is kind of a full circle moment. Thanks, yeah. Sybil. You pay Your work is done here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you bring it back and pay. But no, it's so true. Like, wow, that's why I was craving that. Yeah. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, I think that's the gift of having a vision and stepping into it is we don't mm -hmm. get to decide how far and wide it goes. Right. That and is, and right. thank God we don't because we would restrict it, you know. But that's we right. Do, we do get to participate in, in the process of bringing it, giving it life and, you know, breathing on it. So I think, you know, we just play that role of just, I just want to breathe life into my vision. I just want to, you know, give yes. it, give it, inhale, exhale, and make space for it. The world mm -hmm. will move. You know, that's right. That's right. So tell us about this vision for great girlfriends. And as I was reading in the bio, your 2021 vision for some of the things that you hope to step into with the brand. Of course, of course. So I mean, you and I sit in the same space where you know, I personally love to see women celebrated. I love to see the story of story of friendship and collaboration and support celebrated and amplified. I think that message is essential for us. I think it's essential for my own daughter. I see. I think it's essential for um, all the rising media stars and, and actresses, actors, entertainers, women who are out in, out in the world making moves and having to make a choice between do I collaborate or do I compete? 
Well, here's some options. If we keep putting this message, this narrative on display and give proof, full social proof of, hey, this is what happens when women can come together, not knowing each other and build a platform and create experiences, et cetera, then I think we're creating more blueprints. So my goal is to optimize the blueprint in media. That's it. I want more women to see and young girls to inherit the vision of women collaborating, women celebrating one another, women being uh, allies, you know, women um, loving each other and nurturing each other, women being in the standing in the gap for one another. Those stories that that is happening in real time. I live it. You live it. There's many women who live and breathe it. Um, and I know it doesn't. It doesn't always get as many likes and mentions and as you know the drama and the catfights and all those things. But I'm looking at what my daughter will inherit as content and a lifestyle, and I want to make sure that she and and all her homegirls have the chance to inherit that. So my goal is to optimize that messaging to curate new content that helps to contribute towards better, stronger, more empowering messages for women and also for girls. I think it's just mm -hmm. important that we catch them early and plant those seeds really, really early. Um, and yeah. then help out, you know, I, we have so many podcasters who um, have not built community or have not built audience, but have great messages. And I think it's important that we do have an audience share. Many of us are speaking to the same people and saying something different. Why don't we share? Why don't we create a space where, or centralize the space where women have their a la carte menu. They're able to grab this podcast on a Monday, this on Great Girlfriends on Wednesday, Friday, you know, et cetera, and be able to consume from one place. So um, I wanna make sure that a strong message isn't lost because of the work of podcasting um, mm -hmm. or trying to get um, advertisers on board or, you know, and I also want to build a mighty fist, really strong media right. body that can really, build, really go out and get more funding. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. looks like you bringing together other podcasts that align with yeah. the overall, obviously you're not going to get, or I would imagine they're not all going to be the same, but uh, the same kind of yeah, vision or mission right. of how they want to have yeah. an impact. So looking at, you have the intersectionality of friendship across so many different mediums. You've got health mm -hmm. and wellness, you've got entertainment, you've got fashion. You know, there's so many great shows out there that intersect the message, but in a different industry, a different facet of the world. So I want to bring some, or introduce some of those into the Great Girlfriends community. So that, again, we still have that central message of women supporting, collaborating, and um, celebrating friendship as a centerpiece but all the intersections are represented well so that, you know, a woman in healthcare doesn't feel alone because we got a healthcare show, you know? Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> you right. That's know? right. Women in finance, women in finance are moving, are moving, making waves. And I want to, you know, all of those different facets of industry. Right. I love that. Let me know if you need any help with anything. I'm here to I support do. you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, I, oh yeah. I can't. I should I need help. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love it. I am here for you. So let's yeah. talk about now the Great Girlfriends brand overall, because all of these ideas and new things you're thinking is built on the foundation of what you've already established with building the Great yes. Girlfriends brand. So as we talked about, and everyone, if anyone's just jumping in, we're talking to Sybil Amuti from the Great Girlfriends, founder of the Great Girlfriends, who's talking to us about vision and branding and being aligned with your vision. Vision, trusting your intuition and more. So we're going to talk a little bit about branding now. And I want to know from you, what is, uh, how do we know, how do we know that we quote unquote have a brand? What, what, how do you define a brand? Well, so for me, I look at a brand as the identity of a product, good or service. And that could be a person, mm -hmm. place, or thing. I mean, that's it. So, you know, for me, I'm a brand, you're a brand, right? And the identity, which is the signature of the mark or the thing that authenticates you, in the market. That's how I see a brand. Um, and then you have the messaging that's assigned to that. And then you have all the, the um, products and goods that are associated with it. And you have all those facets. But I think everyone should know. <laughs> Take away one thing. Yes, you are a brand. And yes, you have a brand. It's your unique way of being. It's your unique mm -hmm. way of doing. It's your unique way of feeling. It's the way that you make other people's senses come alive. So all of those ways that you may do that as a person, those are your unique brand identifiers. Those are things that people know. You may not even realize it, but if you ask someone else, they're able to articulate, well, it's this thing you do with your voice, Elaine, or it's 
you know, this way that you look at me or this is the way that you articulate things. And this is the reason why, you know, only Elaine does it this way. And everybody had that aunt or grandmother that cooked the greens a certain way. That right. was, <laughs> that was part of her brand. And nobody- For me, it's my Aunt Willie's banana pudding. You see? I'm like, I don't care what she put in there. Shoe, shoe polish, I'm going to eat it. I don't know what it is, but it's like, I'll take it. <laughs> And guess who better not bring any banana pudding? No one else brings so it. Nobody play yourself and bring banana pudding. Exactly. <laughs> You're so right. You no. Know? And then, you know, you got the people at church. That's so-and-so song. She sings that solo. That's her mm-hmm. thing. But you know, the people at work, you know, you got to run that past X, Y, Z person because she's a decision maker on all things pertaining to blah, 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 because she's become an expert or a thought leader in this space. Mm-hmm. Um and then you have brands that you're just known for. Well, you know, if you're going to use, uh, you know, black women, if we're going to slick our edges, we're probably going to use an eco gel. You know, there's eco. certain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're going to use a black one or you're going to use a clear one. There- right, right. <laughs> you know, but when you think about it, there's all of your favorite brands, your go to, and they've become your go to because they're recognized for a certain way that they communicate their value in the market. And that's mm-hmm. it. Yes. So how do we then build a community around our brand? If that, well, first let me ask, should most folks, especially now with so many things going online, if they haven't been already, should that be a part of almost any brand community? And then how do we build that? Yes. I, you know, it's so interesting because in 2020, a lot of your brick and mortar brands found themselves scrambling online to say, wait, I gotta, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring all my customers, customers, Mm -hmm together, right? I want to bring them together because their their customers are going everywhere. And instead of going to their storefront, now they're going online to a brand community or community relative of people who think and move around that same product to make their decisions. And they're finding different ways. So I think the idea that your customer is not your community would be, you know, you'd be remiss if you did not understand customer is community. The people Mm. that consume your products, the people that are in the market that you are supporting are your community. And people by nature will build community around your product, whether you do or not. So I think, you know, as a brand builder, I think you do your due diligence when you start your brand to consider every listener, every consumer, every client, a community. And in every community, there's culture. So there will always be a persona attached to your community. You, if you don't build it, they will build it around your product. Mm. People who love this, people who like, you know, uh, a certain type of, uh, like Gucci, people who love luxury goods, people who travel and like this country, you know, people will build community and they will build a culture. So I think your responsibility as a brand builder, one is to always have content to support your community, right? You're always going to talk about the things that make your products, services strong things that why your value is important, why, you know, other people's pain points are eliminated as a result of consuming whatever it is you create or what mm-hmm. you bring to the table. You always want to consider the culture, the messaging, tone and texture. I'm always I'm always thinking, OK, how do we make all five senses come alive? For me, that's very important. Feel, emotion, connection, passion, all the things that people can imagine being touched by you if they never see you, they can hear you and want to and feel like, oh my God, Elaine just hugged me with her voice. Right. <laughs> I've actually heard that before. <laughs> that's great. It's possible. I'm like, right? really? I know. I'm like, really? Okay. That's exactly. great. I'm glad you felt that. Yeah. It's like a soothing, you know, it gives a hug. So there's a tenderness, there's touch to it, which is great because that means you're doing a great job communicating support. Support mm-hmm. does hug, you, right? And it does soothe you. Mm-hmm. So you know, so you're making those senses come alive. So I think you always want to consider in, in that, how do you do that through your messaging and how do you do that through engagement that allows people to feel and see what you truly are about? And the best brand, best brands, I love how Apple did it because Apple really personified pop culture. It's technology. They could have gone any direction under the sun, but <laughs> when they came, when it came time for Apple to represent themselves in the market, they took this pop culture persona. They made music their centerpiece. Everyone loves music. So mm-hmm. you always embody and to bring life to anything when you incorporate music. So community is, you know, is that third piece of it. You've got content, culture, and community. Everyone wants to be a part of a good community, a community where culture is strong and you're able to retain them with strong culture. 
this is why the support and sex support and sexy followers are like, I love Elaine. She's consistent mm -hmm. in what she says and does and how she presents and, and, and connects with the community. So they can always come to expect a quality, a certain quality of engagement with you and exchange with you. And they know that people that are inside of this community are like-minded and that gives them a sense of safety because then we're like-minded. We're all on the same mission. We can all share the same similar values and we can share, we can exchange values. So there's growth and contribution there. So those mm -hmm. for me are those three things that I think make will make any brand, uh, will give any brand longevity. It will protect you from a pandemic because- <laughs> Pandemic proof. <laughs> Nowadays, that's part of our language. Like, how can I become pandemic proof? And it's been, who, 2019? Nobody would have thought of that. 2020, it's like, oh, I we used to say recession proof and all these other things, right? Honey, pandemic we are pandemic proofing. <laughs> you know, and you have to. And a great example of that is Peloton. Whoa. Yes. I have so friends right. who've had Peloton bikes for years. One of my friends just used it as her, as her clothing, uh, as her, her dryer. <laughs> her clothing, her dryer rack, clothing. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so people had Pelotons. And Peloton was an expensive bike that only certain people had uh, pre-2020. Peloton built culture and community. Community. I know so many people who up. ride together now. Yes. You're so right. You are so, so and it's so funny. Even the mention of Peloton, I'm hearing it more often. Cause just earlier today I was on a clubhouse chat and all the women were talking about how they ride together on Peloton. And I was like, okay, so I guess I gotta get a Peloton bike now. And I was already yeah. thinking about it, but because yeah. they talked about it, that community of them riding together, it made me want to yeah. get one. Yes. You're so and right. Inside, mm -hmm. of that, inside of that app, it, it's all about community. Mm -hmm. All about community. It's all about supporting community and giving you powerful content to support your journey. Right? Because yeah. when you have that, you have that accountability. The results, Peloton doesn't have to sell a bike. It's a, I put a post up. Should I get a Peloton? Hundreds of comments. Mm -hmm. Here's, Here's my group. I, Peloton, I'm like, Oh my God, they don't even have to sell them anymore. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. You know, They're like, our work is done here. We're just sitting back. With the work. Yes. Yeah. And it sounds like I haven't, well, as I said, I haven't gotten one yet, but it sounds like, I mean, in the beginning, it was more about you get to ride with the teacher. You know, they talk, at least my perception as a, a consumer, yeah. they talk more about the, which was still great because, you, you know, you can't get to the studio or a studio yeah. and you can have a bike there and still be taught by someone. But then it gradually moved to, people riding together, whatever that looked like with slow, fast, whatever it was, yeah. I can ride with my friends in different parts of the world. And yeah. like you said, the community piece really sort of took over. And think about this. So, you know, Peloton was all of, you know, you were an individual rider in your home. You were riding with, with your teacher. You had a leaderboard. Mm -hmm. There was community, yes, but people had the option of being outdoors, right? So you had your soul cycle communities, you had your gym communities, you had all the different options. When all that stuff closed down, all of those people migrate. They're going to go somewhere because they want to commune. Yes. So they're going to find a home. So now I don't know the numbers, but I know that a lot of people spend over $1,000 on a Peloton bike and will no longer need to go to their biking or their cycle communities outside of home because they have found what they needed right there through a digital, enga a digital engagement and digital engagement, excuse me, through community and the product. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that the community is the driver. The community is the driver. And I think it even not that, I mean, we're going all in on Peloton. I think my friend Lat Latina Lindsay works. We, we got to get some numbers from you on Peloton yeah. if you're still there. I have to ask yeah. her like, what is it then? Uh, but it's so interesting too. Even I think the, because as you mentioned, when it first started, when people were talking about Peloton, you know, it's this bike that was over $2,000 and only certain people with certain parts of the country or certain lifestyle had it. But now, because I was even thinking, oh, that might be too big for me. And then people are like, oh, no, girl, I have it in my bedroom. I have it in my, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's just like, I can get, if I could figure it out or pay for it over time or whatever it is, I can put it in my space. It's not so much, a, I mean, it's still, obviously, we want to acknowledge it is a luxury sort of item for some yeah. people. But still, it's just like, right. there's, it's become more accessible, I think, mentally, psychologically, yeah. I should say, because of the community aspect. It feels more like a, yeah. this would be good for me beyond just riding a bike. Well, and it's something powerful about when you can create a movement with community, right? Yes. I think that's what's so important. I feel like the message that I took from, I would say, the Peloton impact of 2020. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this idea of togetherness 
um, this togetherness that everyone craved and that the truth be told, we always crave. And if we can't get it in one place, if you can't get it at work with people you may not even like, but they're coworkers, there's a community there. If you can't get it at church in your sorority and your, um, your social clubs outside, you know, then you're going to find the best ways to cultivate it. And the other benefit of it, a lot of people I know don't have the bike. They just have the app. Mm -hmm. Because the community was strong enough, the sense of togetherness oh. was the driver. A lot of people couldn't get the, the bike. It was on the waiting list for the bike, but the app, you know, the community is still there. You can still, you can still, um, you can still, excuse me, take classes. You can still be a part of the culture. You may not. I did not know that. But you can still get the culture. People want the vibe. <laughs> right. I know. So, oh my gosh, I could talk to you for hours about this. So anyone, if you have questions, I'm going to keep going. If you have any questions, make sure to ask Sybil. But this is, is so fascinating. First of all, I think there's, um, or I imagine there probably will be many case studies about the businesses that um, were transformed in 2020. But I love to see, I mean, Amazon is kind of obvious. Clorox is obvious, obvious, but we didn't know. But once you understand why, yeah. but some of the other brands and things that who would have thought like Peloton and the reasons why it'll be so fascinating to see those yeah. case studies later. So I want to ask you about two. We talked about community, but then about two of the other areas that folks listening and thinking about their brand might not know how to necessarily create um, culture and um, content. Because depending on your brand, you know, for me, the content pieces, I won't say easy, but my brand is literally about content. Yeah. But if I have, a, um, I'm thinking about this woman I know who has a um, product company of cleaning products, for example, what kind of content should she be thinking about? Um, or cult, how does she create culture around what she's doing? Or someone yeah. who has, um, you know, maybe it's an online brand, maybe they don't even have physical products. So I know you can't speak to, you know, everyone uh, specifically, yeah. but just how should we be thinking about content and culture? For our brands and yeah, how did well, you think about it for the great girlfriends yeah sure no that's such a great question and i know it, it for me is like oh you just build content you just create it and zap 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 yeah, and you go like what <laughs> like, how do i do that um right. well or if you're yeah. like a trainer or so many things that we can do but just like yeah. how do i create it well i mean i think there's some core questions who am i mm -hmm. what do i do <laughs> these are like these are generals that help to support you communicating your message in the market. Who am I? What do I do? What do I want my community, which are your consumers, what do I want them to know about these products? Why is this product important? And you can at least come up with, you know, if you come up with one to three bullets, you should be able to come up with at least three to ten if you really, you know, want to get your product in the right, like get your product nestled into people's hearts and minds. Why is this product important to people? What is it doing for them? What problem is it solving? What benefit is it amplifying? It's gonna eliminate a pain point or increase a pleasure, mm. right? So, you know, you've got lipstick, but then you got lipstick that makes your lips fuller. You have lashes, but then you have lashes that make your eyes look, you know, deeper. You know, mm. you've got, you got combs, but then you got different uh, rat tail comb that does different things for your hair. So you have all these things. Some eliminate pain points and some increase pleasure, right? But at some point you are a problem solver. Your product is a problem solver. What are you doing? What is it doing? Why is it? Why is that so important to people? I like to look at the market, the target market, and you know, see who I'm talking to. If I have a cleaning company, I know I'm talking to women. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> Even though commercials try to incorporate men more, but it's like it's women. We we're the ones that want everything clean. <laughs> Objectify Mr. Clean in the commercial. Now they have turned him into a symbol, and he's swaying his hip. And the I mom, know, swaying his hip. <laughs> the mom's looking at him like, "Oh, Mr. Clean." I know. <laughs> role in the cleaning because when he cleans it's just it's hot when we clean right. it's so whatever right. but yeah <laughs> so you know you're talking to women and, and and you're probably talking to a lot of moms right so first of all you're talking to, to women who who uh want to clean home because they don't like dirt so they want to eliminate dirt why maybe they're avoiding mold maybe they're avo avoiding bugs maybe they're avoiding mm -hmm. dust you whatever your problem whatever uh, solve problem your product solves you want to speak to that Maybe it's odor, whatever those things are. But then also, if you're speaking to a, a segment of those women, if you're speaking to moms, if it's going to help me keep my cleaning day, make my cleaning day faster for my kids, if it's disinfecting, mm. uh, you know, all the all the uh, work from home areas, all the school areas, if it's helping to make sure sticky hands don't get all over my 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 fancy, you know, uh, my fancy cabinets and all those things, 
I don't really know much about cleaning products. I have to hear and see, but you want No, but so funny. You're so good because I wouldn't even have thought of the one to make my cleaning day faster if I have kids. Right away, I was thinking, oh, yeah. my kids are small and crawling around. But yeah, you want it to be quick because you have other things to do, soccer practice and all the things, right? Girl, this is why we love product <laughs> wipes and, and the Right. <laughs> like, wipe it down real quick. <laughs> And it's so right though. So so it's it's so you now you're cutting into two categories because not only am I clean, but it's happening fast. And then I really mm -hmm. love it, right? Because you're also considering my time. So you have to get into the mind of your consumer, your community, and think about the things that she's considering. And if you don't, if you're not your consumer, if you don't know her, you gotta get to know her. A focus group always helps. It helps to gather a few people that look and, and think like your consumer and ask some questions about and that. Yeah. Go ahead. About the things. Yeah. The things that drive them up a wall. What drives you up a wall when you're thinking about cleaning products? So what, drive, what do you really love about your favorites? You got to mm -hmm. get into their mind because that's where you want to stay and you want to create an emotional connection with them using content that supports their story being made alive. Like their story has to come alive through your product and that problem has to be solved or that pleasure has to be intensified. And that's why commercials are so important. Because a problem's either solved or a moment is happening that feels so alive that you want to be a part of. Like Coke. Mm -hmm. Coke really makes you want to go to the concert, even if you don't even like the artist. Because right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's right. And you're yeah. so right about the um this idea of um well you talk I love the idea of and I haven't heard it heard it this way, and it might be just branding language that I didn't know about, but the idea of you either solving a pain point or increasing the pleasure. Right. Yeah. So I'm thinking about what it, what are you doing for that person? How do you uh, focus in on that? Um, mm -hmm. And then looking at the not only why does this matter from a, a standard like, oh, this product helps make sure your surface is much cleaner. But I think what you talked about is what is their concern? What are they worrying about? So I want yeah. people to catch too, or, or know that. And you tell me what you think, this idea of a focus group, which is a great idea. But don't think that that has to look like hiring a, a company for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, which God bless you if you can, but yes. to go in and do this formal focus group right now, a focus group can look, and I've done this before, a Google form where you Come ask on. a certain number of people to fill out a few questions or whatever. Then you can ask if you dive deeper, you know, maybe it's just a few questions. So people actually do it. And then you can say, can I reach out to you to ask you more? So I think sometimes even that might be something that holds us back, but it's like focus group just can be Type form, Google form, conversations, or like you did at the restaurant when we used to be able to go out, go to the restaurant, sit down with these ladies, ask them a question, right? So yeah, it's like information we, gathering. We looked at them and we were like, we'd be talking to them. Let's go over. Right. Let's go over and talk to them. The kindest thing ever. We're like, hi, we just kind of want to sit like, and we're like, we'll buy your dinner if you let us talk to you. And it's like, they're like, sure, have a seat. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But it can just information it's gathering. Yes. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you really are gathering insights. And I mean, and even taking the time to observe people in their environment, you know, if you don't have a community around your product, but you want to kind of study, surf a few Facebook groups, get in mm -hmm. there, join and just read and see what they're talking about. Like, just kind of get the insights because people want to uh, be a part of the decision making. They want to be a part of the product. They are all everyone's looking for the perfect product. That's why we keep shopping. So everyone's in the market for what you have and you get to refine it when you pay attention to all the data that people pour. I mean, that's what Facebook, so they're just capturing all the data. and they, all, all the data. Not. So with those DNA, not for nothing, but those DNA companies too, like there's been articles and stuff on them, like they're gathering data. They they might tell you where you're from. You don't know for real, but they are no, gathering. No, like, you're, from <laughs> you're from the, we're all from the Congo, right? It's just like, that, is that, they're like, we need your data. We need your DNA yes, information yes. to sell to you later. 60 Absolutely. Minutes did a great report on it. I digress, oh, but it was very I interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think um, so this is so excellent. And um, from the content piece, if I'm hearing you right, too, it sounds like when we say content, we don't mean articles or, or just mean, I should say, like articles or blog. People think kind of traditional what content. Content looks so many different ways now, whether that's Absolutely. through imagery or content sounds like more of how you communicate yeah. with your audience, content. right? Yep. It's what is what what do you want them to eat? What are they going to mm. consume? You know, right. that content can content can come out in the form of products. It can come, you know, it's there's so many ways you can deliver powerful content. It, it can be it can be an app. It can be, you know, just depending on the, the, the industry that you're in, the content is what do you want them to eat? Like, how can they physically, not physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, maybe physically 
<laughs> your message. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what is going to be the consumption model? Like you want to think about how they're going to eat on your message because what they eat, they'll retain more. So you can keep feeding them and they'll keep retaining it. You know, the podcast for us came easy because I, I you know, content is, is a space that I dwell in. Brandis and I can talk for out. Just we can just pick up and just go for out. It was never we've never been short of a topic, um, mm-hmm. but also there was no barrier to entry. If we wanted a radio show at the time, at the time it would have taken a thousand interviews and pitches, etc. Well, there was there's no gate with podcasts, so we could just pick up, start it. You know, the next day it's on iTunes. Um, That's right. Now it's even easier than it was back then. You know, back then it was. You I know. know. <laughs> I know. I'm helping companies launch podcasts now. I'm like, oh my gosh, I had to do so much more back then. But then it's funny when you talk to people who did it even before then. They're like, it's nothing. Now you can do it literally from your phone to launch yes. a podcast. Yes. yes. Programs like Anchor. So yes. it's not about the launch as much as about as the retention, right? Because how do you right. keep people listening? Well, they have to have something that they want to eat off of. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I know we only have a few minutes left with you. I want to be conscious of your time, but I do want to talk about the podcast. And for those who are listening or watching later or listening to the replay, wherever you all find us, please um, tell us how do we think about at least monetizing, if that's something we want to do, our podcast, or if if not monetizing, I even say leveraging the podcast. Because for me, I do have sponsors for the podcast now. Thank God. Shout out to Ad Large. But um, for me, it's more so I say my podcast is the vehicle all the other parts of my business ride in. So whether Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the book on there or just, you know, building the community, as you said, with women or whatever the things that are that are going on at any time Mm -hmm. um, or just sharing the stories, it is the vehicle that everything is riding in. But some people are thinking more about monetization or just leveraging it. So what's some of your advice for that and what's worked for you and the great girlfriends? So I look at the the podcast more as a platform and um, that platform, I, I see all the different sort of facets of real estate, right? These are all mm-hmm. the things that are properties that I know that another brand would see the value of if they were given opportunity. And so, you know, I think it's important for anyone who is who has a podcast or has a community or has a platform to look at the, the value of the real estate. What do you what do you have? What do you what's it worth to someone else? What is it worth to you? <laughs> and, and then, you know. Communicating that with brands is not hard. You have to just really come up with a, a one sheet, even a media sheet. It doesn't have to be a full kit to start. You don't have to have everything. If you do want to do a media kit, Canva has tons of them, right? So Canva, Canva has, will save your yes. life. <laughs> Canva has saved mine. I literally did my media kit in Canva proposals. Yes. Every, oh, and it's just getting better and better. Which yes. Canva is founded by a woman. We love that too, yes. an Australian woman. Yeah, <laughs> I always know the companies that are founded by women. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, yes, that's all right. Great resource. So I, you know, jump in there and create a, a kit or a one sheet. Mm-hmm. And you can also, you know, for me, I have relationships in the brand space. I was able to just reach out and communicate, hey, I've already built a relationship because that's number one. You want to build a relationship yes. before you just start. And if you haven't, you know, I send a coffee and a pitch. Hey, this is, you know, a little something. I may, may, or, may or may not have heard of this brand. Want to introduce it. This is what we have going on. This um, advertising opportunities are here. We are speaking to the same audience, but this is something that we can use to nurture. Or this is a way that we can help make sure your message is getting in front of women in the right way. Love to chat more. Um, and that's if you're independent. You know, So I believe that, and I'm an independent podcaster, so we're not a part of a network. Um, we've never been a part of a network. But I, mm-hmm. And I'm not in networks. So I'm just saying from in my space, if you're part of a network, there's somebody in the sales side that should be pushing your podcast. But right. you, as a brand, um, I would say brand architect, have in mind the types of brands, a list of brands that mm-hmm. you think are valuable to you, that you know your consumers will love and could convert with, meaning they will purchase from or they're already purchasing from, um, and that communicate in alignment with where you are. Have that list so that it can support your outreach. That's important. It's very important because, I mean, we've had to say no to some brands because they just don't match our messaging. And they were nice checks, but they just don't. They weren't for us. So it's not about money all, as much as it was about brand cohesion, like really making sure we could stick together and, and we could each perform collectively. I could support their message. They could support mine. And without that, you kind of lose the value. So you've got to know what, what you have on your platform. 
Is your podcast just your, is your podcast your one asset? Do you have a community? If so, how many eyes are in your community? What's the engagement looking like? You want to know that stuff because you want to be able to articulate that to a brand and say, hey, you know, we've got 21,000 women in the Facebook community on the Great Girlfriends platform. There's about, I think it's where 85% active members, which is really mm -hmm. strong. We've been featured by Facebook. We've been able to say these things and say, hey, you know, this is a place where you might want to embed some messaging. So, right. yeah. And you can't, one of my friends, her name is Squeaky Moore. She said this one time and I will never forget it. As long as I've been pitching, she said, no, it's not universal. And I'm like, oh, it's so true. Oh, right. That's true. One no doesn't mean no from everyone. Is that what that means? Yes, it does not. It doesn't mean no from everyone. And you may say no to that today, Elaine, but six months from now, you might say yes. Exactly. That's why I think the outreach is still worth it because you never know. It might just be no. I would say not at this time, not that way, or not right now. Not right now. Not this person, not that way, or not right now. Yes. <laughs> That's what I feel like. Yeah. And we tend yeah. to take one no and say, well, it's uh, no, it's not universal. Right. Just because that one brand or that one person at that brand said no doesn't mean that the next person at that same brand who has a different budget. <laughs> mm -hmm, that's right that's why i say if you really like you said adding that making that list deciding what aligns with you and then right. putting it on the radar tell yep. me what you mean by you send them a coffee and a, and a pitch is this literally like Look, you send them a gift card or something absolutely little five dollar yeah. starbucks card goes a long way hey mm -hmm. and this is back in the commute days now i'm like hey i know you're working from home in case you want to run out and grab a car yeah, that's <laughs> awesome and simple surprise and delight right a simple yeah. gift or something to say something yeah. different i love that yeah that's, and, excellent. I mean, that's five dollars right when you're going after big dollars five is nothing to build a relationship and to get attention from someone that you know you really want to tap on the shoulder Right. Yeah. And for people who don't have, you obviously have the great community that you've worked hard to build, but say I'm just starting out um, mm -hmm. with my podcast or community and I want to reach out to these brands. Do I say, well, let me wait, which, you talked about, or, which we talked about earlier, or do I say, that's what I say, what do you have? Even if you say, this is the audience I'm going at, this is the audience I'm communicating yeah. with or planning to do, do you think that's something that everyone listening should know as well? Yes. Well, I, you know, when we started the Great Girlfriends, we we did not have a Facebook group, you know, mm -hmm. we have all of these things in place, but we did have listeners and we had a steady number of listeners that were able to say, okay, you know, at the time, I think it was like 1,500 listeners a month or something like that in the first three months. By We started the podcast in July. By November, um, we were speaking for Prudential, you know, no one ever even asked us about the numbers at the time. <laughs> and then when we're mm -hmm. asking about the numbers, we're like, oh, well, this is what we have in terms of numbers. And, but, but what I'd learned at that time with podcasting was that the majority of podcasts were only getting about 3,600 downloads in the lifespan of their podcast. Mm -hmm. So I use that number to say, while most podcasts only last, last under, uh, I want to say it was under six months, and only received 3,600 in the lifespan, we've managed to amass, you know, by that, say it was 7,000 and we're four months in or whatever be the case. So I use those numbers to prove that we had staying power. So mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily speak to what we didn't have. I spoke to how we measured up against the ones that failed. That's right. And that's good. That's an excellent example because that's the thing. And they say that with podcasting, just to, to speak with that industry, they say like there might be, I'm making up a number, but 5 million podcasts on the platforms, but only I think 20% are still active because people yeah. will do a podcast. It's a lot of work. Especially if you're doing it yourself, not to discourage anyone, but just this is why people are like, I'm not doing that, especially if you have other stuff to do. You That's know, for right. me, when I started, it was all consuming, but sometimes you can't mm -hmm. do that. So, yeah. again, looking at what the real numbers are, I think what you just advise is so important. Like, oh, well, actually, I didn't even realize that people usually just had 3,600 over the lifespan now comparatively, and, and you were still going. Yeah. So, looking That's at what you do. Now. You have to know. Like, you <laughs> Sometimes you don't even realize you're the winner. You're like, wait, I'm actually winning. This I game. am winning by leaps and bounds. Who knew, right? That became my new stat. I was like, did you know this? And did you know? <laughs> did you know? Let me you tell know. you. Well, most no, of the this is yes. where we're going. And just think about you as a podcaster, not knowing at that time, a brand probably certainly, certainly wouldn't know that. So it just mm -hmm. positions That's you right. better. Yeah, that, that is excellent. Value to it at time 
you know, brands did not know podcasts. People didn't know where to download it. They didn't understand it. There was no data. There wasn't enough in the market there could, because there wasn't even a centralized space, you know? Mm-hmm. So we were, we, I, you know, personally made it my business. Okay. When I do speak to brands first, let me explain to them the value of this new emerging market. I, I'm not speaking my language. I'm speaking their language. I want their to articulate. Language. Yeah. Because I'm trying to cross the bridge to their, their budgets. So, <laughs> so I have to speak to what I know matters to them. This is an emerging media space. This is new media. In five years, it will not look the same. Early adapters are understanding and they're investing their money here. Ad dollars belong here. I had to speak to them in a way that helped them understand that they want to be on the front. Innovation is always important in marketing. So if I'm speaking to an innovative space of marketing, it gave them opportunity to be on the forefront and be fresh and be the Mm -hmm. first one to amplify the voices of podcasters. Nobody cared about podcasters. You know, Elaine, we were out here like, we have a podcast. We were like, what? What? Why are you doing that? You can't get it. It's like, can't get a job. Well, can't get, or can't get on the radio is what people used to think. Like you had aspirations yeah, yeah. of being on radio. So you started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, no, I struggle by this. Exactly. exactly. It's so funny yeah. now. This isn't the same as a brand, but my mom, she's 91. And now, you know, every newscaster, everyone has a podcast. And every yeah. time someone launches a new one, she like texts me a call. I see Rachel Maddow has a podcast. I'm like, oh, you're good with it now. <laughs> you like, you like, before she used to be like, what is that that you're spending all your time? Like, all your now time that, on. yeah. All your time. Even though, first of all, I'm grown, but that's a, <laughs> aside from the point. But you know, like you said, now it's part yeah. of the, you know, regular, everyone's yes. launching a podcast. So people that's get right. it. But being yeah. ahead, but I think you're, you're to your point of being able to explain or articulate the value of this new innovative thing or thing that's emerging, I guess you used to say. Right. That's right. And yeah. being able to always speak brand language, like speaking the language is important to make sure people, you know, you're walking into another culture, another land, you're walking in brand rooms, you want to speak mm-hmm. marketing, you want to speak marketing language, you want to speak to what, what makes them tick and not just speak why your content is so amazing because they hear that all day. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. That's true. You want to talk about the distinctions. Yes, absolutely. Now, Sybil, do you do brand consulting as well? Because I'm sure anyone who's listening now, tomorrow or forever in the future is going to want to know. I'm going to ask you, of course, how people can listen to the podcast and all that good stuff. I know you come from a branding background, everyone, when you're watching this, if you can't guess. But I'm wondering, do you do you do that now? Is that something that you are even interested in? Just because, you know, let's answer the question. Yeah, I do. I do. And I I love my brands. Like, I just love, I love seeing our brands, you know, get their aha moment or really understand how to articulate their story, you know, very clearly and evident. So yes, I do do consulting. I do. Okay. Okay, good. Now, do you consult um, big companies on working brands or consult smaller brands on working or both? Yes, on a case by case, on that, yeah, on the, but absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, good. All right, folks. Like now, where I have to, I have to know that it's true. Like if I, what do you mean? If I feel like a brand is true to what they say they want to do, okay, then I have, yeah, yeah, because my kids mm-hmm. are watching, so yeah, yeah I can't be out here, you know. Right. <laughs> and your kids will call you out. I don't know. The kids I know, they will call you out. <laughs> yeah. so it has to be true to true to value for sure. Someone I talked to just yesterday, Nicole uh, Jeter West, she said that she, we were talking about, do you love Nicole? I love, hi, Nicole. Hey, girl. I was in a group. Hey, Nicole. Hey, girl. I was in a group with her this morning on Clubhouse um, that part of, what's it called? Females Forward. So I met her. We all met last night just doing a chat, you know, before you do that. And she's amazing. But she had us laughing because I was talking about owning your name. I'm very big on women having their name registered as a domain. I'm like, even if you don't use it, just please register your domain. So she was saying how funny it was her kids did a Google search on her and they were like, mom, you don't have a website. And she said, she was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? They were like, well, we Googled you and we looked up, tried to, I was like, what did you, first it's so many questions. Like, why are your kids Googling you? But they're like, why wouldn't you? You know what I mean? And they called, she said, she was like, let me go register my, you know, it's just, she said her kids were like, you don't have a red, you know, you don't have a website. What's, what's going on? Are you okay? It's it was so funny. I, hey, Nicole. What you do? You know, exactly. Like, 
what, what are you very saying? successful at what she does? Tell her she's kids. super <laughs> successful, right? And she's wonderful. Oh, that's of course you know her. That's amazing. Yes, because actually, Kwaku, my husband, has worked with Nicole. My Kwaku's art director when she was marketing director at the Knicks. Oh, and so oh. they've journeyed, wow. they've journeyed together professionally. And uh, Nicole's is amazing. She's yes, she I is. Love her. Yeah, she yeah. talked about how she's. I mean, she's such an innovator. She didn't talk about this, but I'm saying she's such an innovator in the the sports behind the scenes, yes. space, the sports space behind the scenes, and all the things she's doing. Yes. I think I can't. The company she's with now is it uh, Legends? I think, or, or maybe, maybe it's not something Twenty Eight. What is it? Team uh, USA. Or, okay, I don't, I'm not Nicole, sure. Nicole, where you at? Nicole, come <laughs> tell us. We got it. We are trying to tell all your business. I thought it Nicole, was Nicole. Is it LA twenty 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 eight? LA twenty twenty eight. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There okay. it is. Yeah. <laughs> hey, girl. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yes. So, Sybil, now tell us how people can get in touch with you from the podcast to reaching out to you. Where's the best place for us to go? And of course, we'll have links to everything. Oh, good, good, good. So they can listen to The Great Girlfriends um, at thegreatgirlfriends.com. Um, follow The Great Girlfriends on Instagram and uh, connect with me at Sybil, A-M-U-T-I at gmail.com. Excellent. Yep. Is it okay? okay we we'll leave your social. email in there. I left my email in there. It's okay. Oh no, I'm saying it's okay. We leave your email. Oh, we put sure, it on. Sure. Okay. You see, yeah. I always when people like email me. Okay, my <laughs> people do email. I just want to make sure you put it. We yeah. can edit it out on the file. Okay, excellent. Yep, 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 it's great. Sybil, thank you so much. I know this was a deep dive into branding. I really appreciate it. I learned so much. I hope everyone who's watching now or later appreciated it. But I just appreciate you as a great girlfriend, thank as a you. sister friend, and as a light um, who is on a mission really to, at least what I see, to bring women, um, help women, as you said, really show up for themselves, especially going into this year and beyond. So anything I can do to help, and I'm so grateful for you for supporting me, having me on your show, you being here. Yeah. So I'm just looking forward to more of us together. Get back together, yeah. Get back together, yay. Thank <laughs> That's you so, so much. Thank you. A absolutely, hold on one second. Bye everyone, we'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>